Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 254, recorded on February 17th for air on Monday, June 20th, 2016. Case, Lynx, and Green Peak. Triangulation is brought to you by Texture, the mobile app that lets you access the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere, using your phone or tablet. For your free trial, visit texture.com slash triangulation. And by Carbonite. Keep your business safe this year Protect files on your computer or server with automatic cloud backup from Carbonite. Try it free without a credit card at Carbonite.com today. And use the offer code TRIANGULATION to get two free bonus months when you decide to buy. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology and spend some time learning about them and about stuff. And I am thrilled to have a pioneer. Once again, we often do pioneers on this show. But Pioneer, you may not have heard of. Case Lynx is here. He's currently with Green Peak Technologies. But uh, Case goes back to some very early days. Oh, basically, wireless is your thing, Case. Welcome to Triangulation. Hey, Great. thank you. Glad is, to be is, here. Is everything you do about wireless, pretty much? Uh, the last uh, 25, 30 years, yes. Before that, what was it? <laughs> Before that, I came from university. So, yeah. uh, what did you study uh, in university? Uh, mathematics. Uh, Maths. Math. Just not, math. Uh, not um, computer science, electric engineering. Well, I mean, that were all kind of the subjects yeah. in there. So, yeah. you know, uh, making chess computers and all, chess that, computers. All, all that kind of stuff. Wow. I, as a chess player, I love the idea of chess computers. I hate the fact of chess computers. When you were doing it, they were those standalone yep. devices and you'd move a piece. Some of the fancy ones had magnets in the bottom would move the piece. Exactly. exactly. Uh, I had a few of those and they got better and better and then pretty soon you couldn't beat them. No, no. Uh, but that That's turned out to be an easy problem compared to Go. Have you yeah. been following yeah, that? Yeah, I've been following that too. Uh, it's fascinating. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Why do you think Go is so much harder than chess? Um, because it's, uh, in, in the way, it's uh, way more complex right. uh, be because of its simplicity. Then, is that then, interesting? Then it's interesting, right? Because chess, you have, it looks complex, 64 squares. Uh, you have, All I these don't different know, pieces, five different yeah. kinds of pieces, yep. six different kinds of pieces. Uh, and a ver almost infinite p number of possibilities, which is always amazing when you look yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they all start the same 10 moves, and then who knows what's going to happen. In fact, Bobby Fischer, I remember, uh, hated the standard setup so much, he invented a random form of chess. Yeah, I know. Where the back <laughs> rank would get randomized. Right. I play that a little bit, because I don't want to go against the guys who've memorized the first 25 moves. Yeah, yeah. But Go is just uh, two black and white stones, yeah, yeah. much bigger board. And that's that's why the complexity explodes way faster. Yeah. And that's computers are good at pattern matching, though, right? So you'd think that that would be a natural for Go. Uh, no. No. Pattern matching is very difficult for yeah. computers. Right? Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Babies uh, can look at a face and know immediately it's their mama. E exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Computers need to kind of study for years. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you start doing wireless? Well, actually, uh, just running into uh, into some friends and um, and. Uh, talking with each other, what, what was getting quite popular in, uh, and I'm talking now late 80s, uh, mm -hmm. the previous century. Early days of the PC revolution. Early days of the PC, but you had cordless phones. That's right. No cellular phones. That's well, right. they were just, just being invented, but cordless phones were at, somewhat, And they were at 900 megahertz to 700 900 megahertz. 900 megahertz, these big things with yeah. these long antennas. Yeah. Yeah. So and and you know this was kind of um, uh, having a chat at an uh, at an McDonald's or uh, you know. There's uh, a McDonald's in Utrecht. There's a McDonald's in Utrecht, <laughs> and uh, we said. Wouldn't, That's sad. Would, now I'm now I'm sad. <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if there would be? Well, I mean, wouldn't be wouldn't it be nice if there would be something like Wi-Fi? We didn't call it Wi-Fi in those years, but yet cordless phones. Why wouldn't you have cordless computers? What a convenience! Before uh, cordless phones, you had this long cord; you right. get wrapped around right. you. Right. Um, so it was easy to see that that was a technology that made sense for consumers. That's what you would think, but we had products in uh, in the early '90s, and people didn't believe it could work. Um, they thought, you know, your data got lost in the air. Uh, people are concerned <laughs> about health. 
There were a they're thousand. They're still concerned about health. And they're still concerned about they health. They never stopped. Right? But um, now the very interesting thing is we had first products early uh, 1990, 1991. And the real market breakthrough was 1999 with, can, a, with Apple. Yeah, you convinced Steve Jobs that Wi-Fi was the thing. Well, I got a call from Steve Jobs that he was looking for something that, uh, that we had, something like wireless, that uh, he wanted to use to differentiate uh, his, uh, his iBook with compared to other laptops in the market. So laptops didn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, until 1999, you, you Ethernet connected them. What you maybe remember these pocket LAN adapters? Yes, uh, I remember. You, they were you, like a you, credit card. They were the PCMCIA cards. No, even before that, you had uh, you plugged it into your printer port, and, <laughs> oh, then, and then you plugged your That's Ethernet right. card in there. It, it was a Centronics port on the back. Exactly, <sighs> exactly. I do remember that. That's and, you, and then it was really a modem as much as... Uh, and you had the modems, right? Yeah. The, the What is it? The, exactly. Well, that, replacing that modem, that was the first thing, you know. Yeah. You had always had that wire to yeah. the phone line. And yeah. we said, you know, can we do that wireless? Um, yeah. So replacing that wire was, was the first... But the funny part is today, if I ask my son, do you know there was life before Wi-Fi? <laughs> You know, I was in the early 90s doing computer talk sh radio shows, and people would say, oh, yeah, we're going to build a house. What should we do for... Uh, it wasn't Internet in those days, because people weren't Correct. getting online to the mid-90s. Right. Uh, but So maybe it was a little bit later. And you'd always say, oh, yeah, well, you definitely want to put uh, Cat5 in the... Uh, in the wall and maybe coax your cable. We have Cat5 in was, every room in our house. It's so wrong. <laughs> How wrong can it be, right? How Who wrong? knew that it was going to, that was the wireless revolution totally took over. Right, exactly. We're talking to Case Links. He's CEO of, of Green Peak, which is a Zigbee uh, company. We're going to talk about the next step in wireless and Internet of Things, which is fascinating. We'll have more with Case in just a bit, but first a word from our sponsor today, Triangulation, brought to you by Texture. You know what texture is. Oh, I love texture. I love, see, I love magazines. Magazines still, they're, they're an art form uh, all their own, right? Long form articles, great images, great pictures. The problem with magazines is it can add up. You know, there's like, I would say half a dozen magazines every month I want to read at least one article in. But if I were to buy them, you know, that's like 30 or 40 bucks. If I were to subscribe, even worse. I got a better solution for you. Every magazine, you know, all the best magazines, kind of like Netflix for magazines, on your iPad, your iPhone, your Android device for one flat rate that's like a couple of cups of coffee a month. I'm talking texture. For instance, there's always, every week, there's a New Yorker article I want to read. I love the photo layouts in National Geographic. And by the way, they look even better, higher res, higher quality on your iPad than they do on print. Um, Rolling Stone, always one article every month I want to read. Esquire, Vanity Fair, I can go on and on. And then, you know, you also get the gossip magazines. You got people in Us and Entertainment Weekly, so I can kind of keep up on what's going on with The Bachelorette, you know, all that stuff. I love this. Every page in the newsstand issue of your favorite magazines, plus previous issues. You favorite the magazines you know you want. They'll download. You can read them offline. You could, Yeah, boy, if you travel a lot, don't buy. I always bought a stack of magazines to get on the plane. Not anymore. You got your texture. Here's the deal. Go to texture.com slash triangulation for a free trial. You can even share with your family. So you really only need one subscription per family. That's what Lisa and I do. We share our subscription. You can actually access up to five devices for one account. So everybody in the family can have their own magazines, all with one texture account. You can read the magazines offline, of course. Just download them. Read them anytime, anywhere. They have also got, if you're not sure what you want to read, a new and noteworthy section, top stories section, curated category content categories so it's they, they've done it this is just what you want this is just what you want and i want you to try it free texture.com slash triangulation free trial i think you're going to want to subscribe there's two different levels you just check it out and see which one you want we've been happy subscribers for months now lisa and i and and we just love it texture.com slash triangulation and now, thank you for allowing me to interrupt, but back to our uh, conversation with Case. Welcome back to Triangulation. Case Links is our guest, CEO of Green Peak, but a pioneer in uh, Wi-Fi. 
we were talking about the early days of Wi-Fi. And in, in the early 90s, since people weren't really on the Internet, they were, I guess it was dial-up modem to CompuServe or Genie or MCI exactly. Mail. Or, the e emails were kind of getting popular. Yeah. Uh, so starting to replace fax. Yeah. Um, so that's actually what, what was the first... I would say the real application that was this uh, at NCR off. when you were doing this NCR computers. That's uh, when we did this. Wow, uh, Dayton, Ohio, wow. all places in the world. Did you live in Dayton? Uh, I was there very often. Oh, <laughs> well, but you stayed in Utrecht. Uh, yeah. the, and the and the whole effort of uh, wireless LAN in NCR was was run uh, in, in Utrecht. Interesting, Holland, right? Um, it's it's interesting. So you call it LAN. Local area network. Be, but it really was, if it was just to a modem, it wasn't a LAN yet. I'm thinking these in these early days, if you had one computer, wasn't, you know, that was it usually. You didn't have smartphones, tablets. You often didn't even have laptops. Correct. You had desktops, well, right? Right, right. So, Luggables. Luggables. Remember, we call them Luggables. Lucky, <laughs> I have one in the basement. It's, 20, it's 30 pounds. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, but it was still, see, I, I often think that, where things really went wrong was when we started to do networking in the house because that was something designed for the IT professional. Mm. And all of a sudden, normal people had to learn about routers and switches and hubs and then and Wi-Fi access points. And this got the complexity just... Right, right. But, but it has come a long way because, it's much you know, easier now. I mean, you have, a, you have a router, you plug it into right. a cable or into a... Uh, into DSL uh, environment and you can connect any device in your yeah. house. So isn't it remarkable? We have come a long way. Yeah. The, the first, the first wireless LAN. I mean, the first Wi-Fi. We thought it was uh, uh, a standard and interoperable. Forget it. it was. <laughs> and now this is 802.11. That's the underlying uh, standard for the the very first for one. the radio. Correct. Before B. It was 802.11, 802.11B, 802.11A. It's, it's AG, funny, AA A came out, and then G and N and AC and... Why did you choose 2.4 gigahertz? Um, well, the, the first products we had were in the 900 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Like but the cordless phones. But, uh, like the cordless phones. But the problem was that in Europe, the 900 megahertz was used for cellular phones. Ah. So... Um, then we looked for another frequency band, uh, and the next frequency band that was available was the 2.4 gigahertz. But um, initially, the, it was not allowed to do data communications hmm. in the 2.4 gigahertz band. So yeah. we had to start lobbying in Brussels, we had to start lobbying in Tokyo, in Beijing, for making the 2.4 gigahertz a worldwide frequency band. And to our amazement, there was so much attention going into the cellular phone, in the cellular phone market, that it was kind of agreed on uh, as a sideline. And all of a sudden, we have a 2.4 gigahertz band that is pretty much worldwide available. And, and, unreg and essentially unregulated. And essentially unregulated. Uh, and in a way, that's the power of Wi-Fi. It's often used as an example of, see, this is why government regulation is a bad thing. Where did the innovation happen in wireless? It happened where... I, I, entrepreneurs could innovate exactly without t I didn't realize though that you were forbidden from doing data initially it was, was in, that in Europe, the US as well or in, just no, Europe? in Europe it was initially forbidden uh, yeah. for data and and even in Europe every country had its own regulations so right. for instance even today I believe officially the 2.4 gigahertz is owned by the French military and you are officially only allowed to use Wi-Fi in the big cities and not in the rural areas I mean, this is folklore almost, but... Uh, I imagine people still buy uh, Wi-Fi routers in, in rural it's, France, it's, it's right? Not, it's now everywhere. Nobody's right. stopping them. No, nobody's stopping them. It's interesting. But it gives an idea of the, of the local folklore of the 2.4 gigahertz. Right. Right. It had kind of, you know, put together into a, you know, that you can buy one product and ship it worldwide. Yeah. And that is the power of Wi-Fi as well. It's as a, you have it in your laptop, and you don't have to worry if you go to another country. Yeah. You turn on your laptop in the hotel, you are on the internet. It's uh, pretty remarkable. So there are pros and cons to 2.4 gigahertz. It's a microwave, so it doesn't travel very far. That's probably a pro, right? We call it a spectral reuse. You can use the spectrum in your house, and, and the neighbor door. can use yeah. the spectrum yeah. in his house. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's a balance. Uh, if the range is too short, then you don't, you, you're not in your house. Right. If the range is too big, then you interfere with your neighbors. It's a kind of a lucky shot. 
that it works out with the with the range and what right. we have. Yeah. It was it was just right. And even in most homes, can you go through walls as long as there's not metal on the walls? And exactly. Things like that. Yeah. It's it's kind of remarkable. It, it's. It, uh, <laughs> We're very proud of it. You, Let me put it that way. You should way. be. So uh, the NCR was acquired by AT&T. Correct. And you were folded into Bell Labs, which then was spun out as Lucent, right? As Lucent. That yeah. was the, the C. But I didn't even change my chair. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't matter to you. <laughs> the only thing that changes was the business cards. Yeah. Uh, and we've been pioneering the standards, uh, it's, uh, creating a, a IEEE working group. Uh, with, with quite some other companies as well. I mean, let's put it in perspective. Yeah. Uh, th this is an effort, an industry effort. As uh, it should be, it, because you, you want it to be a, uh, an open standard. You want anybody to be able to adopt it and use it, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yet that's a challenge, because there's politics and uh, these uh, meetings, I'm sure, lots of this, uh, There's lots of politics. I mean, everybody thinks from inventing Wi-Fi to where we are today is a straight line. Mm -hmm. Oh, forget it. What were the big hurdles? What was the first big hurdle? Besides, well, the first one was getting Europe and Brussels to agree. Yeah, the first big hurdle was one frequency band mm -hmm. worldwide because we had a 900 megahertz product. And mm -hmm. for instance, Apple and 3Com, another name from the past, 3Com told us, you know, come back if there's one frequency band worldwide. So they, didn't, was, they didn't even want to look at it until there they was did, universal. No, no. I mean, they, different, you'd have to have different radios. That's the problem we have a little bit with cell phones right now. That's also changing, isn't it? So that we're finally able to make universal cell phones, that can, but you have to have 10 different radios. There, there are 10 ra <laughs> different radios inside. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's why there are now so few uh, radio chip suppliers, because the complexity is, uh, is tremendous. Isn't that interesting? Uh, yeah, Qualcomm basically owns it, I guess. Qualcomm, yeah. yeah. Intel. Um, so w w how, let's talk about the standards, too. So 802.11b comes along. About when did that? Uh, come on. Uh, the the starting of the effort was uh, was mid 90s. What was the goal with 1996? B? The goal was uh, higher data rate. 802.11 without any letter was two, one, mega, two, two megabits. megabits. I thought it was one megabit. Two megabits. It was two megabits. Still slow. Second. Still slow. Yeah. But, well, but I mean, it's amazing how your your, your 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 modem was uh, what was it? 14 point K. Well, that's what right. You don't need. Per you second. don't need two megabits. If you're on for email, up. for my, for yeah, and and most initially, most the Apple Airport that was the first breakthrough product, immediately connected to a dial-up line. That was <laughs> I it. I had it. You I had it. Remember it? Yeah, very well. It was well. dial-up line. So I yeah, mean, why did they call it an airport then? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of landlocked airport. airport. Right. Um, interesting that I did not realize that Apple made the first Wi-Fi uh, in a computer. Now, in a way, uh, Intel was. Uh, with Centrino stole the show a little bit. Yeah. But the first product came from Apple. So Centrino, the chipset had Wi-Fi in the Centrino yeah. chipset. That meant a motherboard would come with Wi-Fi. With Wi-Fi. And that was about one and a half to two years later. Yeah. So 2000, 2001. Yeah. That, uh, that Intel came on board. Uh, the initial view of Intel was uh, Bluetooth will take over the world. No and kidding. You, and you don't need Wi-Fi. No kidding. And, you know, Centrino changed the mindset, uh, changed the history almost, or the perception of the history, and made Intel one of the founders of, uh, of Wi-Fi. Why did uh, Wi-Fi beat Bluetooth? Um, the higher data rate. Data rate and, and uh, range. And range, but in particular the networking capability. Bluetooth is very much a point-to-point point point point. point yeah. connectivity, but, you yeah. know, you want it to point-to-multipoint. Right. So... But again, that's a little forward thinking because in the earliest days, people didn't have multiple systems. The, the first the first Apple iBook and Airport was point that, to point. Point to point. That's all you need. What are you going to have? You have more than one Airbook, MacBook? Right. What are you, right, what are right. you nuts? Right, exactly. <laughs> what are you, rich? And, uh, and nowadays, uh, I mean, I can't remember how much effort it took because it took almost a decade to convince, you know, that Wi Fi would be a useful. Uh, Thing to have, yeah. And nowadays, I bet if you count the number of Wi-Fi nodes, we, we call them nodes in your house. Yeah, the number of devices that have Wi-Fi, you know, tablets, smartphones, laptop, computers, you know, you, probably your TV, you, you know, your, your game station. My Roku device. I look at my when I look at my uh, router and I see all the things paired. I go, wow, there's like 20 or 30 devices. There you go. And that's probably very typical. There you go. And of course, with Internet of Things, it's my doorbell is connected now. So. That's going to only uh, take off. Um, so was when you went from uh, B to, uh, what is it, then was G and then A, then an N, 
Was that in every case increasing bandwidth? Yeah, the major the major driver was higher data rate. Yeah. That was the major yeah. driver. Um, Are you still involved with this? Were you involved with N and AC? And I got out in uh, in 2001, 2002. Yeah. That uh, that time frame. Yeah. Uh, it had to do with uh, at that time a gear system had spun out of Lucent, and uh, the focus was very much on uh, on on uh, uh, on Wi-Fi and on fiber. Mm -hmm. And in 2002, there was a sort of a meltdown of the fiber market. And the gear systems went somewhat in a panic, and they pulled everything back to the United States. Mm. And at that time, I had the chance to, uh, well, or to or to move to the United States, or uh, or do your own to go to go do something else. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you decided to stay in the Netherlands. And I had done Wi-Fi at that time for probably close to 15 years. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I go pioneer somewhere else. RF is always to me a black art. It is, in a way it is. It, you know, so much of what we do, what we do with computers is deterministic, you know. It, it's, it's cause and effect, it's rigid, it's locked. Right. Right. If something goes wrong, you may not know why, but you know there's a, a root cause. But why, radio frequency, you can move <laughs> something one inch, and wow. And I guess and it's, it's still deterministic, but it's just more chaotic. It, it's very much cha yeah. more chaotic. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, it's also influenced by signals from, from, from outside, from right. other places in the world. Right. Uh, it's like the weather. You a don't know. solar blast, you know, and your, <laughs> yeah. uh, your Wi-Fi gets, yeah. gets a hiccup. Uh, are, you, uh, are you amazed at the, at the widespread uh, use of Wi-Fi and maybe even more the, by the success of it? Yeah. I was just, just on a cruise to be, just ship. To be Here I am in the middle of the it. ocean, right. and I'm getting Wi-Fi in a metal boat, satellite to Wi-Fi throughout the boat, perfect reception everywhere, and high speed now. And and on planes. On planes. On planes. We had our first, you know, talks with Boeing in you know 2000, 2001, uh, for integrating Wi-Fi. It, it took it took an, another decade or so. Yeah. We had our first uh, meeting with General Motors, I believe, in 1997, 1998. My car has Wi-Fi. My car has Wi-Fi. Uh, That's it crazy. It took a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> so on one hand, the vision was there. Yeah. With, um, uh, we are, I am uh, amazed about the success of Wi-Fi. Yeah. So you have AT&T, Lucent, working hard on Wi-Fi, and Ericsson in uh, Finland working hard on Bluetooth. B on Bluetooth. Um, was it a race? No, it was more a battle. It was uh, a battle. It was a battle. Because <laughs> I think of them as either. parallel developments, because they do diff such different things. I didn't realize there was such competition. But initially, uh, the positioning of the technolo technology was, you know, to stand uh, in, in to try to to grab as much land as possible. Right. Uh, so when Bluetooth was announced, it was literally announced by Ericsson and Intel, who was part of the first. Bluetooth Intel sick again, as man. Well. They got their fingers in every. Pie, they got their fingers they? in everything, <laughs> and they said you don't need Wi-Fi. They didn't believe it. They this didn't is pre Centrino, no, obviously. Right. Yeah. This is pre Centrino, and the success of Apple and Wi-Fi pushed Intel into the into into. Actually, it pushed the industry in understanding that there are different use cases yeah. for high-speed networking yeah. and wireless connectivity. So wireless connectivity is. Bluetooth mm -hmm. and high-speed networking is Wi-Fi. Well, that's kind of why I think of it as parallel because it, they, they do different things. They're useful and they're both useful and almost every device but now in, has both. It, exactly. But in the early days, it was not, the business cases were not very well understood. Isn't that interesting? That's, so that's why so saying, you're, you know? sitting, you're sitting in the uh, waiting room at Apple to talk to Steve Jobs. Is, is Dr. Hartson... In, the, in another chair next to you waiting to talk to Steve next? Or did Apple consider Bluetooth? Um, I think they have looked at it as well, yeah. but then quickly realized that they needed a higher data they rate. They knew what they wanted. They, they wanted the 10, 11 megabit per second that yeah. uh, 802.11b was B. offering. And that higher data rate was, uh, was the convincing point, I think. And mu multiple devices. And well, multiple devices, yeah. Uh, initially, our Bluetooth does multiple devices as well, up to eight. But uh, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, but um, yeah, you can have multiple uh, I guess devices to your phone, right? Yeah, uh, right. But uh, um, I think the vision of Apple was uh, replacing Ethernet, and Ethernet at that time was 10 megabit per second, 100 megabit per so second. So it was perfect. So it was it was closer aligned yeah. as a networking technology. Yeah. Did you talk to Steve himself? Mm -hmm. Did he seem to understand? Steve and and and, uh, and and Tim Cook uh, were personally. Tim was there involved. too. Yep. 
Interesting. Personally involved in, uh, in getting the first deals closed. Because at the yeah. time, Tim had to figure out how to make it. <laughs> right? Tim had, yeah, to get, yeah, exactly. had to get yep. the factories to, to make the parts and get the parts into the... Well, we, we did that also for him. Oh, you uh, did? Yeah, we did the PCMC card. Uh, but we got a lot of help. I mean, positive and positive, right? Yeah. So, and when you say we, it was NCR. It was NC. Well, it was Lucent. It was Lucent by then. At, at that time. Yeah, I remember Lucent. I remember Lucent chipsets actually. Yep. Yeah. 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 Those it was Lucent early. Semiconductor, and Lucent Semiconductor right. became a Gear Systems. Uh, that became a Gear, and then was Atheros at the same time? Atheros was a startup that that run parallel when we yeah. were doing the, um, and and Atheros was uh, was very much focused initially on access points. So right. spe uh, special chips for access points, right? Uh, and then they further developed it into a business, and ultimately ended up in the in the arms of Qualcomm. Uh, they weren't trying to make it for the motherboard or for the, the computer. Initially, not. they were just making a base unit. Base but station. later on, they yeah. they expanded. Yeah. So, uh, did, was your sense that uh, that you had to convince Steve of the value of this, or did he see it right away? Uh, Steve saw it right away. I will, be, I will be frank. I mean, the, the power of Apple and the power of Steve Jobs is recognizing when new technology, when markets are ready for new technologies, uh, and knowing what his customers wanted. I think too. Yeah, the, the market readiness. Uh, yeah, and there was been talking about wireless for a long time. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had been pitching Wi-Fi in its early stages on the Apple Newton. We had made a sleeve that fit over an Apple Newton to provide wireless connectivity. You remember the Apple Newton, the PDA? I have three in the other room with PCMCIA cards with a little pop-out RJ11, uh, RJ45 jack that goes in there. You know those? Exactly. And I remember the wireless sleeves, but I don't think there was... Oh, I know what I had. This was in San Francisco. There was a company that was putting wireless uh, internet access on telephone poles, Metricom. Oh, Metricom, yep. You remember them? Yep, I remember. That wasn't a Wi-Fi technology. No, that was the that was a wide area network equipment. Right. They were an ISP. A, a pre a pre cell phone, right? Yeah. A pre smartphone. Actually. Right. Yeah. I had a Metricom. Yeah. Look, just in case you don't believe me, here are three Apple Newtons. <laughs> when you say, "Do you remember the Apple Newton?" Not only do I remember it, I remember it sadly with with fondness. I miss my Newton. So it was a sleeve you could put on here. Right. One of these still has, yeah, this has Velcro on the back for my Metricom modem. For your Metricom modem, right. Yeah. There you go. And that would plug into the modem, I think. I'm trying to remember how I would connect it, because these didn't have Ethernet. Um, they did have PCMC. These are the, see, the kids who are watching today, they don't remember PCMCIA. They thought I was joking when I said <laughs> you would put the phone cord <laughs> into that. That that was it, and see that Apple uh, Apple. So Apple knew early on that getting online was going to be an important uh, part exactly. of technology. But the breakthrough was not with the Newton. And when Steve Jobs returned to Apple, oh, after, this that's after, right. This was John Scully's. This was baby. Scully's product, yeah, right. right? And it was uh, Steve Jobs returning to uh, Apple and moving Apple from the desktop into the laptop space right. with the iBook. Right. And Steve Jobs was looking for a what he calls a unique differentiator for, right. for the laptop. Right. And uh, we've seen some emails from uh, Michael Dell when Apple announced uh, wireless on the iBook yeah. saying, you know, why don't we have this? <laughs> and we had been talking with Dell for two, three, four years. Uh, and he was furious. He was furious. Apple has this, and we don't. Uh, why is that? Uh, that is a, that's such an interesting difference between uh, a Steve. It was both an asset and a liability to Apple. Was that Steve was the whole thing, right? He knew what was going on. Nothing happened without him saying okay. Michael Dell is a more traditional organization, very hierarchical. Dell's still that way. And so they've got managers at lower levels having conversations with you. Dell ha Michael has no idea. There's nothing going on at Apple that Steve Jobs doesn't not only know but have his has fingers in, right? Exactly. That's that's a pro and that's a con. Yeah, it's a pro and a con. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, was it pretty easy once, you know, Jobs' eyes lit up and said, "Good, we're going to do this." Was it pretty easy getting it to work? Um, the technology was actually it was quite, mature. quite mature. Yeah. Um, it was getting the right cost point, yeah. uh, scaling the, 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 the manufacturing. That were the challenges, but they were all operational, executional uh, yeah. uh, issues. Uh, the technology at that moment was standardized, it was working, it was mature. And that's what I'm saying, you know, uh, sensing when the market is right, when the technology is right, and when that match is there, that was the power of Apple.
We're talking. This is so much fun. I'm sorry. We've gone back in time. We'll go forward in time in a minute. We're talking to a Case Links. He is uh, the founder of a company uh, called uh, Green Peak. You should have called it Green Links. <laughs> Green Peak is fine. You know? Okay. <laughs> Green, <laughs> Green Peak, which is uh, doing something with wireless that's kind of a little more timely uh, these days. And we'll get to that in uh, just a moment. We'll have more with Case Links in just a little bit. I hope you're enjoying the conversation, but I have to interrupt momentarily just to tell you about our sponsor, our great friends at Carbonite. I, they've been a sponsor for so long, and I'm so grateful to Carbonite because they have saved so many people. I was on the website the other day. I think it's 50 billion files saved. Billion with a B. That's 50 billion files that would have been lost forever without Carbonite. Think about your own experience. Is there something on your hard drive you just can't afford to lose? Something you would hate to... You'd cry if you lost baby pictures or wedding pictures or emails, uh, voicemails from a loved one. I mean, there's got to be something on there. Even things like saved games or uh, favorites, bookmarks. We have a lot of stuff on our computers, and if it's a laptop especially, it's so easy to lose. Carbonite makes sure you don't lose a thing. Go to Carbonite.com. You can try it free right now. You don't need a credit card. Use the uh, offer code triangulation. That way they know you heard it on this show. And we want the credit. A million and a half people, and that's homes and offices, trust Carbonite to store their precious data. Let me kind of explain how it works. It's automatic. So you, you subscribe to Carbonite, you install it on your machine, and you forget about it. Or your servers or your network, you, they have different plans. But let's, it's less than 5 bucks a month for everything on a Mac or a PC. So let's start with that one. So you install it. This is what I do at home. I'm a home Mac. You know, by the way, I have external. I use Time Machine. I have external backup on my Mac. But this is important because if somebody stole all my stuff at home or there was a fire, uh, something, you know, disaster, the backups so of the Time Machine be gone. But because I have Carbonite, it's real peace of mind. I've got extra an extra layer of protection. It's continuous. So as long as I'm online, it's backing up. I write one file, I change one file, boom, backed up to the cloud. Uh, it's automatic, so I don't have to think about it. In fact, I really only think about it once a year when I renew my subscription. And then install it and forget about it. Now, you don't have to. In fact, it's a good idea every once in a while to check what's on your Carbonite account. You can do that with your tablet, your phone. They have free apps for that. You can even log, log in on this machine here and see what's being backed up from my machine at home, even download files. So it's cloud storage too. Carbonite is really an amazing solution and a very affordable plan. Check it out. You can try it free. You don't need a credit card. Use our offer code triangulation. And the other reason besides giving us some credit, which is nice because I work hard on this show and I really want it to do well. And if you enjoy it, it's one way you can pay us back. But also you get two months free when you decide to buy. So it benefits us both. Carbonite. you got to back it up to get it back. Do it right with Carbonite. Use the offer code triangulation for two months free with purchase. Now back to our conversation with Case Links. Welcome back to a Triangulation. Our guest is Case Links, founder and CEO of Green Peak, but a pioneer in wireless networking and Wi-Fi specifically. If you are online right now watching this, and you're not connected to the wall, you can thank Case and his team at Lucent for making that uh, possible and for selling Steve Jobs on the notion that, uh, I guess Steve knew, but. Uh, so uh, you got out of Wi-Fi, you got out of, you said, enough of that. <laughs> I don't want to go to one more meeting debating the merits of beam forming and <laughs> I'm done. Exactly. Although us. you have to be impressed with what AC is doing now. Oh, I mean, that is remarkable. Absolutely. Very impressed. And also uh, about the power of the technology. They've yeah. had such a uh, lead. Lots line. of legs. Lots of legs. I mean, we're getting on our 802.11 AC Wi-Fi access points, 100 megabits, 150 megabits. The, the distance is huge. And yep. on some of the devices, I think we have a, beam, a couple of beam forming devices in here. It aims at you. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> It is mind-boggling. Uh, it is. It is. Tech. That's one of the things I love <clears throat> about technology. It's as it, it, and you a, a perfect example of how it both moves slower than you hope and faster than you ever dreamed. That's the, that's the right way to formulate it because uh, a lot of people say technology goes very fast. Sometimes to me it feels like it goes very very slow. But on the other hand, you have to realize how much needs to be done to get, right. say, to get a worldwide standard, right? I mean, that's... Uh... Well, that brings us to home automation, which is something that uh, we has been 
bubbling underneath for longer than I think almost any technology I can remember. I remember going to Comdex and then CES and looking at the pavilion, the home automation pavilion. But part of the problem is uh, there's been no standard. There's no 802.11 for uh, IoT. Well, well, there is 802.15.4. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey, hey! It's something. <laughs> hey, that's a that's a good starting point. And so what is the, so now mm -hmm. you're going to have to help me here because you you're a big you're behind Zigbee. Zigbee's your thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also but there's you know there was X10 uh, and there's Z-Wave and now I think Google has its own mishmash of protocols, right. Thread, Thread, and Weave, right. and Brillo. Brillo. <laughs> No wonder consumers, and, the, and then consumers, you know, they take their phone and they say, well, I want to talk to the doorbell. Oh, there's one app. I want to talk to the thermostat. There's, there's another, another app. app right? Oh, I want to talk to my garage door. There's another app. Uh, it doesn't talk to each other. And consumers, I think, like the, the idea of home automation, the, and particularly like the idea of telling, saying out loud to your house, set the thermostat to 72, open the garage door, right. I'm about to leave, start my car. But it doesn't, the promise is much more in the, like the early days of technology where you have to just do it all yourself and figure it all out. How did, the, why don't we have, Yeah. What, what's the problem here? It's a good question. Um, because I, I hear that question many times. Yeah. Um, what's taken so long? What's taken so long? Uh, actually, there's a simple answer. Yeah. It is very complex. Yeah. Uh, computers are a very uniform platform worldwide. But anything in your home has its own standards, its own background. Uh, I usually give the example of door locks. Every country in the world has its own standard for door locks. What, you mean my door lock's not the same as oh, it is in no, the Netherlands? Absolutely. <laughs> and, and the Netherlands is different than Belgium or Germany. Oh, or no, that's UK. crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's like power plugs, right? I mean, right, it's same thing, same isn't Same thing. It? All, yeah. te all technology was invented over and over again. Independently in different countries, in different countries yeah. Yeah, and, and um, what, what you would think, you would say, okay, you know, um, uh, Home automation should be very simple. Right. In reality, it's, it's very, very complex because of this reason. Let me show a slide <laughs> from your site on uh, Zigbee. Uh, there okay, you, go. you want to know how complex this is? <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow, you've got a HomeKit open and interconnect. You've got all join, which I've never even heard of. You've got Bluetooth mesh. You've got the Wi Fi guys. You have 802.11, uh, 802.11, you got 802.15.4. But actually, if you are a network guru, you kind of recognize layers. You right. Know? That's the first thing that is important to understand. So tell us about layers. Well, let's talk about layers for a second. When going back to Wi-Fi, yeah. uh, the real underlying layer is IEEE 802.11. And on top of that, initially... Is that a protocol? Uh, you can call that a protocol. Okay. A, a radio, a physical protocol. It's a physical protocol right. that has a radio transmitter and receiver. It says how, how loud you need to transmit uh, and, and, you know, what, what bandwidth you're using, what yeah. frequency you're using, et cetera, okay. et cetera. Okay. A protocol is a set of agreements, right, yeah. that, you, that you do things in the same way. Now, on top of the radio, you need, you need also to interface with you know, with the network. Um, right. And uh, that's also a protocol, you know, when and wh how are you going Your to handshake. package... Your handshakes. The handshakes, the, the packets, how yeah. are you going to put data in a, in a right. data packet, etc. Now, the interesting part is, you know, we tend to forget history very, very quickly. But the early days of networking, we had Ethernet, Token Ring, Token Bus, ArcNet. I mean, right. that was a big mess too. It was. It was, you, you were either it. Novell we, or you were Do you, you were remember Cisco Novell or, Network? Yeah. You, you remember IBM Land Manager? Absolutely. Microsoft Land, Land Manager. Manager. Oh, my God. Benyon Vines. Yeah. You know, IBM SNA. Uh, uh, so, I mean, there was... You're right. There, there was a big mess, And too. until Ethernet kind of became the de facto TCP standard. IP. TCP IP. TCP IP. TCP IP became yeah. the network, became the de facto yeah. standard. Yeah. And then everything started to fall in place because everybody so that's wanted an, to... Okay, comply. so there's the Ethernet layer is a physical layer. That's mm -hmm. Bob Metcalf's layer. Right. And then Vint Cerf's layer is on, riding on top layer. of that, right. which is TCP IP. That's the packet, how you agree to talk, how data is stored or exactly. transmitted and all of that exactly. stuff. So, that's, so there's a physical layer and on and top... There's a network layer. Network layer. 
No. We're actually, there's seven layers, but we're, we're going to make this in two layers. We're making it a little bit simpler. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So home automation. We have the same issues, right? We well, have well no, there's a third. There's oh, there's third more layer layers. To, to keep in mind. There's I the mean, application layer. The application layer on top of that. And that's usually hidden by, say, Microsoft right. or, or the Apple operating system or by Unix or Linux uh, nowadays. Yeah, so that are the three layers you have to so kind of keep So those are your drivers that talk to the... The, 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 the protocol, so your, your application, your application. So, you, so you you launch Mosaic or Netscape or, <laughs> or Internet Explorer, and it knows how to talk to a driver, which then talks to the hardware, which then talks to the network. Exactly. Okay. That's not too many layers. That's in that's it, that, that all makes pretty sense. Pretty straightforward. Now, yeah. We yeah. are in in, the, in 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 somewhat of the same stage that the bottom layer now for home networking is crazy. Is 802.15.4. Oh, it is, is standard. It's standard. The bottom layer is now agreed. Okay. So, what is the name? Is there a name besides that? No, there's not a name. That's, this there's is, not a name. It's this like triple eight two two dot fifteen four. Fifteen four. Okay. It has been embraced by Zigbee. Yep. So if you say I'm Zigbee compliant, then you use eight two two dot fifteen dot four. Okay. Good. One of the competing networking standards is Thread, but if you say you're Thread compliant, you're also using I triple eight two two dot fifteen. Thread is the Google uh, implementation. It's the Google. But it is fifteen four. But it is using the same radio. Okay. I know the uh, the on hub that Google makes the uh, Wi-Fi router they make actually supports 802.15.4. So there is agreement already on the on the bottom layer. Yay! So we are making progress. Yay! Now we, we are in a sort of we have our Ethernet. Okay. Now we are in the in the stage of uh, the middle um, layer. Novell Network and uh, and, right. and IBM LAN Manager and right the software running on the, top. The, of the that. networking software is yeah. not standardized yet. Okay. And big companies, they are battling this out right now. So I'm looking at, uh, at this. This is a great slide, by the way, that really helps understand me understand this. Despite the fact that the first time you look at it, you might go, Whoa. Oh, my God. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> but uh, you can see we have this physical link layer uh, pretty well agreed upon. Uh, but now we have uh, the network transport layer. There's RF4CE. And there's Pro. Pro is a mesh technology. Pro is a mesh technology. Uh, that so means every device can talk to every other device. Exactly. And as peers, sort as, of. As peers. And, and share their connectivity with every device, right? Yeah, exactly. And the original idea was that you can cover larger range right. uh, with mesh. Only technology. one thing needs to be connected to the outside world. Everything can connect through. Can connect via via each to, other. Yep. It's a, it, mesh is a good description of that. Uh, is that going to become more of a standard, or is what is this RF4CE? Well, RF4CE is a is a um, a point to point or point okay. to multi point standard that you see in most of the remote controls being used nowadays. Okay. Uh, yeah, because the whole idea is that with your remote control, you are already doing home right. networking. Right. And if you talk with your remote control to your shuttle box, and your shuttle box can talk to other devices ah. in your house. Ah. Right. Then you, you see, so RF4C is a step up of the operators, the, the, the Comcasts of the world. They want this. To, to get into the smart home. And this is where we have, this is one of the reasons we have problems, because every different company wants to get their own wedge in the door. And nobody wants to use Google's system or Zigbee or because exactly. we want our Comcast system. So RF radio frequency for consumer electronics, electronics is right. that RF four C. But they're not incompatible? Uh, well they talk via routers. At this moment they talk via they, via they have via a translator that translators in between. Uh, okay. Yeah. So um, it, it is it's kind of the, the market is learning about applications and the most successful applications, the networking that is being used by these applications they will start weighing through in the market. That's our When I say Zigbee or Z-Wave, what layer is that? Um, Zigbee is covering a vertical from application okay. to network to radio. So it says we combine this physical layer with this it's transport layer with, with this, this application, application layer. layer. Right. Z-Wave is the same. But the Z-Wave radio is, uh, yeah, we call it a proprietary solution because there's only one company that offers this solution. Interesting. Which is Sigma Designs. Right. That's one, but that's others one have company. licensed it. No, they're using it. Or, oh, they're using they're it. They're using it. They're buying it from they're Sigma. They're buying from Sigma. Okay. Right. right. Uh, and then I see frameworks, which are, you know, Apple's HomeKit, of course, is the best known uh, framework, but Microsoft and Intel and Google and everybody else is going to do their own framework, right? 
and uh, the framework is sort of how to pull all the applications into one application and then talk down. <laughs> And now the industry the is still sorting this out. <laughs> hey, you asked why why isn't it there <laughs> now today? I know. It's the complex it's way way more complex than Wi-Fi. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. But there is there is good news. I, I oh, think, give me the good news, please. The, I think I, I see you should know the good news. <laughs> What's the good news? Uh, the good news is that people start to really appreciate uh, smart home applications. You know, like they are. Like, I agree. like thermostats, like security. The, the Nest thermostat made a lot of sense. Security is probably the f the first thing the, people use, the, right? Uh, smart smart meters, uh, so yep. that you can see your energy consumption, yep. that you can control your energy consumption. Yep. Uh, there will be convergence over time, but um, we have to learn what are the values of all these different applications. Uh, As it stands right now, and one of our sponsors is Smart Things, the Samsung uh, hub. And their idea was, well, we'll make a hub that can talk to Zigbee and Z-Wave and can kind of intermediate, you know, kind of trans a gateway, in effect, to uh, the various... Essentially, yeah. Is that how this is going to be solved, or is one protocol going to win? What do you think? We, we think that ultimately maybe one or two protocols wi will survive. Right. That, that's our expectation. But this has been the problem all along, is, it's, uh, is that there isn't a winner. Right? Not yet, because we are still learning about the value of the applications. You need a Steve Jobs to come along, as he did with Wi-Fi, for and instance, make it happen. For instance, or, or we just need to realize, I mean, th things in the home are different. This is my favorite example. You have central door locking in your car, yeah. right? Yeah. But you don't have central door locking in your house. God, I'd love that. Don't you think that's strange? I go around every night and check the windows, the we have many sliding glass doors, the front door, the garage door. Yeah, I have to, that's a, every night. I'm like a night watchman. I might as and, well carry a lantern. And you can't, cannot even buy a car anymore that without central do door locking. Uh, yeah. So, and why, why is that? Why it, is that? It's because of the, because of the complexity that <laughs> right. we need to learn how to get these things implemented. And everybody, even at, forget Europe and the U.S., in my house, every lock is different. Some you flip up, some you flip down, some you turn a knob. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, not, not exactly. That also needs to standardize and, and, and be, become, um, you know, more harmonized. In as long case. as you're doing this, can you also, because I have to remember to turn off the cuckoo clock every night because it keeps me awake. Can you just add that? <laughs> can you just add that into the lock the doors and turn off the cuckoo clock? Put your pillow on it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, we often talk about it when we do the ads for smart things. We talk about this dream of being able to say, you know, to your phone, good night, and everything kind of just happens. The lights go down or whatever it is. Um, but people realize very quickly, the people who want to do that, that this is a lot of work. You have to get every device talking, and it's just crazy. And there is no standard interface. And there's no standard this, interface in the, to all the yeah. devices. So that's why it is taking uh, longer. And there's an, there's something else as well, because ultimately I think um, there's something else setting in as well. You have to keep that in mind also. Um, the Internet of Things is not so much about things as well as about data analytics yeah. that understands what yeah. needs to take place. Right. If there is nobody in your house and the back door is not locked, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was a butler that locks your back door? Right. Because yeah, so it understands. You, you do not even want to get a phone call that uh, you know, your back door is not locked. No, you want your back door it. being locked. Yeah. You may get a message. Yeah. Uh, hey, I, I noticed the back door. your back door. I locked it. That if you want me to unlock it, let me know. Ex right? Exactly. Exactly. So, so um, and that's also a little bit the smart home. I think it's a wrong term. The, the home is not so much smart as well as, you know, there need to be data analytics that connects the devices in your house yeah. to something that understands what is normal in your house. Yeah. And, and that is kind of happening as well. That is in development. So yeah. Apple has HomeKit. Is HomeKit compatible with this or is it kind of saying, no, we're going to do this? Apple HomeKit is on its own. It's its own pillar. It's its own ecosystem. How about Google with Thread and Wave and Brillo? Uh, fully Weave. in development, fully in development, building an ecosystem. Uh, so they're they're not para they're not equals. HomeKit is one thing. Google is doing something else. I would say they are comparables. They are. They're, okay. they're trying to uh, solve the same problem, but coming in from a complete different angle. You work with Thread, right? Is it, is we work with Thread. Yeah. Thread. Because it's an A to two dot fifteen dot four radio. Right. We are a radio company. Right. We make radio chips. Right. And in a way, 
what is built on top of our radio chips, we try to serve everyone. But that's easy, that's software. Well, software is not easy. I've, I've learned <laughs> that very much. Uh, but we, we try to be agnostic. The software guys say hardware is easy, so I don't... <laughs> exactly. the, we try to be agnostic right. for what software runs on yeah. top of it. Um, and then Intel has its own... Iotivity of the open inter... Uh, of the they use the <laughs> right word, open, interconnect, but right. is it open? Um, it's open, yeah. It's, uh, it's, is it's, Google's it's, open? It's, it's IP donated to the, uh, oh, good. To the Linux Foundation. Oh, nice. They, so they, it's truly they, open. They run, they run the, the OIC. Uh, same with uh, Alljoin. Uh, also What's Alljoin? That's, uh, that's a, a that's similar, a similar uh, activity from Qualcomm. Okay. Very comparable. Uh, uh, Google is, uh, is a little bit more complex. Um, Some is open? Thread is open. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, a standard very much only focusing on the network layer, not right. on the application layer. Right. They've got... Only on the network layer. Brillo is a, is a application. And Brillo is, again, very comparable to HomeKit. Right. More an operating system like And it's Google's Brillo, and and app, like Apple's and, and Brillo then competes with HomeKit. Right. And we'll have to see how that, uh, that evolves. Is Microsoft in this? Because they were very early on all in on uh, automation, and it seems like they've pulled back a little bit. Um, Correct. They're waiting we, for somebody to we become. We don't there. see a lot of Microsoft yeah. in the standards bodies, and um, yeah. no, it's, uh, they're concentrating on other things. They have other things, and they are. But you know what? They are as a cloud company and a data company. So my guess is, Satya Nadella is saying, "Well, we'll figure out. Whenever somebody wins, we'll be there to do the analytics, to the support the cloud." Exactly. Yeah, that's a smart. That would be my guess. <laughs> that's what I would do if, <laughs> if it were up to me. <laughs> Let's get out of the fray. Get out of the battle. Um, uh, we're talking with uh, Case Links, who is uh, the founder of Greenpeak, uh, but also a pioneer in wireless connectivity. You can thank Case uh, for all of the wireless things you do these days. So much. <laughs> Talk to Steve Jobs into putting Wi-Fi in the uh, Apple uh, laptop of the time. What was it? The iBook. iBook. And uh, and changed the world. Thank goodness we had a standard. Now we're sitting here with this kind of tower of Babel called uh, home automation. And, of course, as we get all of these things on the Internet, already we're seeing issues. You mentioned the issue of the uh, the, the uh, beauty of having a common button to lock all the doors in your car. But now we've seen that these fobs can easily be hacked. Uh, and there's a very you know simple transmitter you can buy on eBay for 20 bucks that will let you get into many of these cars. So... A lot of these are designed not really thinking about the, the security issues. What do we do? Uh, we, we, um, the, the security is an issue and it will continue to be an issue. I think it's holding it back in some ways because I think people hear about these problems or the ring doorbell, you can take the doorbell and steal somebody's Wi-Fi connection. And they're saying, by the way, you can't do that anymore, but you could. Um, they're saying, I'm not going to buy. I'm 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 worried. I'm not going to buy these things. I'm putting an intruder in my home. I'm giving some some machine access to my internet, which is going to then give my Wi-Fi to anybody who wants to get in. Right. You know, the, the standard thing is people always make trade-off between benefits and risks. Of course. Um, of course. Uh, my favorite example is cars. You know, uh, how many people you know um, are using cars and still you know. It's very a car dangerous. Car is a dangerous thing, right? It's very dangerous. It's even way more dangerous than flying, etc. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, so, it's terrible. So people, in a way, are risk takers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the, the challenge in the industry is, if the security is broken, you know, fix it. You get updates from uh, uh, from Apple or from uh, right. from Microsoft for your oper operating system. Many many of these these uh, updates are to fix security issues. Your Android phone gets uh, gets updated. Uh, That's a good point. I mean, so this, a phone is a security. With, with, yeah. with the smart home, you know, right. it, there will be security issues, and there will be issues that need to be fixed. Uh, they need to be updatable. That's actually that's the happy ending of the Ring doorbell story, which is they were able to push a fix out before it was public knowledge and they exactly and they patched it exactly um, so, so it's it's up to you to 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 weigh the, the the benefits of the smart home versus the risk you're you're running um, and uh, that's something the industry has to learn has to get comfortable with Wi-Fi initially I mean why did it take so long people didn't trust right 
their data going through the air, you know, were, were Well, they were, they were kind of right. <laughs> they were right. They were absolutely right. But the benefits started to outweigh the risks. Right. And, uh, and in, in particular, the, the first, first Wi-Fi was, was, you know, was bad. From I read an article from a Dutch uh, paper uh, last uh, November that scared the heck out of me why public Wi-Fi is mm -hmm. so dangerous. I don't know if you saw it. A guy sits down in a cafe and snarfs up uh, people's Wi-Fi. is able to do all sorts of things. I started using a VPN and... Uh, yep. And, uh, Recommended. <laughs> yeah. From now on, I use a hardware firewall everywhere yep. I use public Wi-Fi. Um, but so, in other words, these are solvable problems. You just solvable, have to be aware of them. We, we cannot kind of, you know, just ignore them. Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. And that's not what the industry is doing. Right. Not at all. Because uh, there is a very strong tendency to, to fix these problems. So you're in favor of mesh, the idea of mesh networks. Uh, well, th there, there are mixed feelings about mesh. Uh, uh, everyone talking to everyone uh, in a mesh network. You know, how many times do you have your, your refrigerator talking with your toaster? Probably doesn't right. need to. Doesn't need to. Um, yeah. Uh, and On the other hand, if my refrigerator has connectivity, lending a cup of connectivity to my toaster is not a bad thing. We think on the longer term, uh, star networks, like Wi-Fi originally was developed as a mesh too. Oh, really? Yeah. Everybody to talk with everyone. Yeah. But that uh, didn't, that, you're right, star it, is better. It's now, yeah. it's now a star. Yeah. And what's the advantage? You've got a hub and spokes. Hub and spokes. Mesh was interesting when uh, hardware was not too reliable. Because if, if one link down. was broke down, yeah. then you had an alternative. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, if you have a star, the, 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 the hardware is so reliable nowadays that if something breaks down, you want to know what it is. Right. So then you can fix it immediately. Okay. And, and we think that uh, probably many uh, Zigbee implementations will be star implementations, despite that, uh, the fact that Zigbee has mesh capability. Right. So you could go either way. And this is, by the way, what Green Peak does. You make the the Zigbee a silicon, the chipsets. We, we make the chips the that go into the products that right. enable uh, connectivity, correct? What would you, uh, given that we want, we want home automation, we want this capability, it's too complicated right now, it's too, it's just crazy. What, what do we need to do? What do, I'm sure you're working towards this. You've been here before, once before, so yep. what do we need to do? But, uh, what, what, we, what we are doing, what we're focusing on, are useful applications for people and using that as stepping stones. Uh, I mean, one example that I gave was the remote control, right? Right. I mean, oh, I would love that. I mean, that's, having that on a standard, techno standard RF technology is just a step forward, enabling other steps. Uh, another thing that we are doing you is... You can do uh, Zigbee over RF for CE, right? Zigbee over RF for CE. So I could uh, have a remote control. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, another thing that we are doing is, uh, is, is home monitoring um, that is, you know, um, for elderly people living at home. Yeah. So um, the, the sensors, and the, there are a few sensors in the home, get an idea of the pattern of somebody living at home alone. And then, you know, the caretaker change in the pattern can a recognize a change in the pattern yeah. and sends a message. And that's our very valuable applications. We are extending this now into family lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that, that I can see whether my son or daughter comes home from school. Right. And I do that with my ring doorbell. Well, <laughs> there the you go, right? I mean, so, so <laughs> but I'd love to have the data analytics. People are nervous, though, about privacy implications with that. Uh, it's a good other point, yeah. Uh, and also there, there's a balance, right? I mean, yeah. take, let's take Facebook and privacy right. versus Facebook. Right. People see a lot of advantages of Facebook, right. and they have to give up some privacy. Right. And you know, it's your choice. Right. Now you can get sucked into uh, giving up too much privacy. Well, we have to, to learn the hard way right. and take a step back. As long as you know what the transaction is explicitly, like Google now, I, uh, I don't, I'm glad for Google to know everything I'm going to do because it gives me such valuable insights exactly. into that, right? Exactly. Yeah. I have a, I have a comparison from the old world. Um, um, th there, there is legislation that basically does not allow anybody to open a letter that is not addressed to you. Right. Right. Um, that legislation has not kind of migrated into the age of no. internet. And it's in a way too bad because um, uh, when that legislation migrates, you, you get you get the same kind of level of protection as an 
individual for things that you want to kind of keep private right. or that you want to share with a person that is on the letter. Right. If you write an email, it's almost like public for, for Sending the government a or for the... Yeah. Exactly. So, um, but the interesting part, and you know, um, we are all learning and this t technology from a, you know, a bigger historical view is all very new. And a lot of te technology people do not really understand the, the, the reach of what is being invented, let alone that you take lawmakers yeah, who haven't studied technology need to write laws right. to protect individuals from right. the consequences of technology. Right. But, you know, something simple as, you know, let's expand the secrecy of a letter to, to an email, that an email is as secret as a letter was, I mean, that kind of thinking needs to start to percolate amongst the lawmakers right. to see how the internet can become more private, more secure. We are learning. We are all learning. We always get the sense that in the EU, the EC is much more privacy focused. And uh, do you feel like they're doing a good job? Uh, uh, I'm, the jury is out. We'll see in the future yeah. who, who did the right job. Right. But um, the fact that action is being taken yeah. to to take to take action and to learn from taking action is way way better than just leave it alone. Yeah, um, yeah we're very laissez-faire in the United States. And maybe a little bit too much, yeah. and maybe in Europe we are kind of you know jumping the gun too fast. Right, I don't know. Yeah. Let's let's learn from each other and, okay. and see what uh, what the pain points I are. Agree. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to be gained uh, from uh, you know a safe and secure internet for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw an, uh, a quote recently that, uh, you know, after the invention of fire, uh, the breakthrough is the invention of internet is mind-boggling. Right? Yeah, I agree. Things that we have now at our fingertips right. compared to, say, 20 or 30 years ago, it's amazing. And it happens so gradually, we, don't e we take it for granted. We take it for granted, right? We don't even remember how life was before. <laughs> I had to go to a library to find out who was the eighth president? <laughs> what are you talking Market about? Market <laughs> research, you know? I mean, we have table conversations, my wife and I, and then she asked me a question. And I said, no, let, me look it up. let me look it up. No, no, I don't want to have any computers on the dinner table. Well, but you want an answer to the question. What do you want? Do you want conversation for the sake of conversation, or do you want an answer we on could, the question? We could make it up, or we could find out. <laughs> right. What do we want? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, no, it's, it's mind-boggling. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we have to learn how to deal with it in, an, in a good way. I, yeah. It's a very exciting time, a very challenging time. There are problems, but as you've seen in your own example of your own life, these can be solved. It just takes time and work a lot of work and i'm optimistic that we can fix the yeah. problems in privacy and in security would you like z-wave to just go away uh, let me say a few positive words um home rf do you remember home rf yeah uh, home rf was an early competitor of wi-fi right and it helped people to understand the value of wireless z-wave you know is an early technology right for um helping people to understand the right. value of, of applications for the home. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, take Wi-Fi. We had many generations of Wi-Fi. Right. We'll have many generations of Zigbee. And Z-Wave will, will just fold into one of these right. other right. generations. Right. Uh, it will not be Z-Wave forever, but we learn about these applications that have been enabled through Z-Wave in a very early stage. And the faster we learn, you know, the more fun we can have. That's great. Well, I'm excited about the future of this, and I appreciate the work you've done uh, already and the work you're going to do to, uh, to make it happen. Thank you. Thank, thanks for having me. Case links, greenpeak.com. Uh, Is there anything else you want to tell people? Uh, that you want to get them to write to their member of Congress or anything? or <laughs> Just go out and buy some stuff? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I think... My, my kind of message would be, you know, there is a, a lot, things in, in the world can go better and better if we use technology in an, in an, in an accountable way. I agree. There's a, that's a great motto. I like it. That'll be my motto from now on. Okay, Thank you, Case. It's really great meeting you. Thanks Welcome. for coming in. We do triangulation uh, normally every, this is a pre-record, but we do normally every Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 1900 UTC. You can watch live if you want. Chat room is always hugely valuable. Uh, during the show. That's why we call it triangulation. Me, a guest, and you in the chat room. But if you can't watch live, don't worry. On-demand audio and video always available after the fact at our website, twit.tv slash TRI, or on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash triangulation, or, of course, you could best way to do it, subscribe 
Uh, you can uh, go to any podcast application, search for TWIT or Triangulation. You can, um, of course, get the TWIT apps on every platform, Apple, iOS, uh, Android, Windows Phone, Roku. There's five Apple TV apps now. Thank you to all of our great fans who are developers as well. Uh, just find an app, subscribe. You don't want to miss an episode of Triangulation. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.